Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're so very happy that you've all joined us today. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging is located on and our work is done on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganyan Kahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jodage, commonly known as Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many Indigenous peoples. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples we serve within the Montreal community. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or the MCSA Education Committee, started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of their needs. To enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging. And finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Our presenters today are Dr. Nimzak and Dr. Busserhal. Dr. Nimzak grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He graduated from the University of Vermont with an undergraduate degree in communication sciences and disorders. He then moved to Syracuse, New York for graduate school in audiology. While at Syracuse oh, University, whoops, sorry about that. While at Syracuse uh, University, he completed a clinical degree in audiology and research degree in auditory neuroscience focused on how the brain understands speech and background noise. He did his externship training at the National Center for Rehabilitative Auditory Research and Portland VA Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. He then became a scientist and faculty member at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College, where he is currently an assistant professor of medicine. Dr. Rachel Busserhall, is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at École des Technologies Supérieures, or ETS, in Montreal. She completed her bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering at Michigan State University. Following her passion for audio and signal processing, she moved to Montreal in 2012, where she completed her PhD at ETS in 2016. Her PhD focused mainly on speech signal processing and communication enhancement mm -hmm. for intraoral technologies. During her postdoc, she became interested in exploring other signals captured from inside the ear, which has laid the foundation for her current and future projects. Before continuing, we would like to remind you to please mute your microphone on Zoom, and that if you have any questions, you could either wait until the end of the conference to ask them, or you could write them down on the chat box in Zoom. I will just encourage you, though, for this presentation, if you have a set of earphones to wear them, uh, we'll be using some sounds that you might be able to hear a little bit better if you have earphones on. And now I'll pass it off to our presenters to start their presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Caitlin. That was was a wonderful introduction. Um, Rachel, will you move the slide deck forward? Yes, of course. Oops. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. So as Caitlin said, um, I have a combined audiology, which is basically an ear doctor and a PhD in auditory research. So the reason why I got into this was because I saw firsthand those people coming into the auditory clinic, the aging population, and those with hearing loss, and I fell in love with the auditory brain. I fell in love with how people use their brain to hear. My clinical experience really focuses on, like Caitlin said, um, on those that served in the military. Um, I worked as a um, audiologist at the Portland VA Hospital and at the National Center for Rehabilitative Auditory Research. And I'm currently a scientist at Dartmouth Hitchcock. And um, uh, a lot of this presentation uh, you might remember because I work directly with Dr. Jay Bucky. Dr. Jay Bucky is the PI of the Space Medicine Innovation Lab, and it is his research that has really laid the foundation for what I will talk to you today. Next slide, please. This picture, this picture says it all. This picture is a cognitively challenging task. What you see here is speech and background noise. And you may look at this and be like, what well, cognitively challenging task. No one's remembering, you know, the last 10 words that were presented to them. No one's drawing a circle at quarter after five. 
No one's, no one's even having to draw a three-dimensional cube. No, they're not. They're understanding speech. And they're understanding speech in background noise. That is probably one of the most cognitively challenging tasks that we do every day. You have to understand the sound. You have to make sense of the sound in your brain. Then you have to respond. This is all happening in a very, very fast time frame. It's very quick. My speech that I'm even talking to you right now, there might be background noise that's going on uh, behind you. You might be doing a speech and noise task right now. And this is the focus of what we're going to be talking about today, or at least my research. So my research directions are focusing on the central auditory system. And I will explain that in just a minute. Really, what we do is we look at how people process speech and background noise and other complex auditory scenarios like sound being presented to ears at the to both ears at the same time trying to understand the timing of complex auditory stimuli but what we do is we try to use these tasks to better understand the brain to understand various cognitive or i should say clinical populations so today we'll talk about mild cognitive impairment and alzheimer's disease but really where this research started was in hiv and right now we even have other branches of our auditory of our research directions excuse me in those with tbi and also with long covid so what is the central auditory system now this is a this is a great question because in our grants when I talk to individuals, a lot of people get confused about this. You can go to the next slide. This is a picture of the peripheral auditory system. We're all at least more familiar with this. It shows on the outside. I don't know if anybody can see my cursor. Can everybody see my cursor here? Maybe. Uh, if not. No, I don't believe so. No, because it's mine, uh, Chris. Uh... I see. I see. Well, that's fine. I, I will use my words. <laughs> um, so you can see the outer ear or the pinna. You have your ear canal that leads into your eardrum, followed by the middle ear space, which is uh, a hollow space. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, that has that is three bones, the ossicles of your middle ear. And that goes into your cochlea or your hearing organ. For this lecture and for, you know, maybe if you have, I know that Canadian Thanksgiving was uh, a little while ago, but um, this is what we would like to call the peripheral auditory system. So just a tidbit of information. We are going to focus on after the cochlea. Okay, you can see here in the bottom of the screen, you can see that cochlea, that snail shaped organ. That is really where sound is transduced or converted into electrical information. But the central auditory system is everything that happens afterwards. It is the brainstem, specifically the cochlear nucleus and the inferior colliculus. It goes into the brain. It goes into the auditory cortex of the temporal lobes of the brain. And this is where we like to focus our research. Okay, so how do we measure the central auditory system? We do it primarily in two ways through behavior and through neural imaging. For behavior, like I said before, we focus on speech and noise. Speech and noise incorporates a lot of cognitive challenges like we talked about before, but we also do this in a couple different ways. Temporal auditory processing. When I say temporal, you think time. Temporal, time. That is a very, very challenging aspect for the central auditory system because Auditory stimuli, like I said before, happens in real time very, very quickly. Also, dichotic auditory processing. This means incorporating sound that, that were presented to ears at the same exact time. So we have three general tasks that we use to tax the central auditory system. Also, neural imaging. We use electrophysiology and fMRI. So electrophysiology is really placing small little kind of cup shaped electrodes on the head, playing a sound to the ear or ears, and then recording the neural circuitry of the central auditory system. It's very fast. The electrical system in the brain gives us a very accurate timing measure, whereas fMRI gives us a good spatial measure. 
it gives us the spatial resolution of the brain, meaning that we can look at individual areas where the electrophysiology gives us good timing. The goal of all of this is to really combine both behavior and the neural imaging, because one and the other by themselves is great, but we want to look at this together. We want to understand the brain. We want to understand the final output, which is behavior, and we want to kind of link the two to get a full picture of what is really going on. Okay, so speech and noise, getting back to this, this really, I don't know, I really love this because it just, again, it taxes the entire central auditory system. Okay, and what's cool about this, and I think maybe it's so cool, is that this is a routine process. It is done every single day. And again, like I said, you might be have you might be listening to me with speech or I should say with noise in the background right now. The speed must be quick. You must pay attention to the speech signal and also disregard the noise in the background. And then you also have to match what is heard to stored knowledge about words and phrases and then repeat that back. Carrying on a conversation is a cognitively challenging task. But how did we really get to this point? How did we know that speech and noise is a link to cognition? That is where we talk about HIV. And this is real, really where Dr. Jay Bucky really, um, I, I have to give him an incredible amount of credit here because what he did was he went in and looked at those with HIV and those that were developing neurocognitive deficits due to HIV. Just as a background, we have gotten incredibly good at treating HIV with um, retro antiviral medication. However, people are living longer with HIV. People are still developing neurocognitive deficits due to HIV. And this is happening in low and middle income countries. Well, doing long neurocognitive testing isn't always feasible in these countries. So what could we do? How could we better understand the brain in these low middle income countries? Well, that's exactly where central auditory tests can be used to detect, to monitor, and to help treat HIV neurocognitive deficits. So here are some of the results that happen out of that HIV work. We used a speech and noise test, and I'll bring your attention to the top portion of this figure. It says the HINT composite. The HINT stands for hearing and noise test. And this is plotted with the MOCA. The MOCA is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It is a screening measure for cognitive function. So it incorporates a little bit of everything, just like the HINT does, because that is a speech and noise test. If we look on the y-axis, the axis that goes up and down, you see the MOCA score. At the top, that is a good score. A 30 is the best possible score you can get on the MOCA. On the x-axis, that horizontal axis at the bottom, is the composite SNR. Don't worry about that. All you need to know is on the left side of that graph are good speech and noise scores, meaning that people could understand sentences in background noise even when the noise was presented at a high level. If we look at the top left of that figure, you will see that those that, who scored well on the MOCA also scored really well on the HINT, meaning that if you did well on the speech and noise test, you did well on this cognitive screening measure. As you can see with the red and blue lines, they're angled. They point down to the bottom right of the figure. That shows us that those that did poorly on the speech and noise test also did more poorly on the MOCA, meaning that we found this relationship. However, we thought about this. The MOCA is not, is not really a cognitive specific task. It is a screening measure, meaning that it incorporates a lot of different cognitive domains. So recently, we've published a couple more studies. You go to the next. Uh... This are links to specific domains. Now, we've linked central auditory tests, specifically the TDT or the triple digit task, very similar to the hint, instead of sentences, the subject has to repeat back digits in background noise. We linked this test to learning and memory. 
we found the same basic result. Those that did well on the speech and noise test, the TDT, also did well on the one card learning task and the one back test, which is a measure of learning and memory respectively, okay? In this, we didn't really find too much of an HIV effect, although those with HIV did more poorly on the cognitive tests. What we found is we found this relationship across those living with HIV and those without. So let's go to the next, let's go to the next slide. What does this mean? This brings us to mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. This is a slide that Dr. J. Bucky showed at his last Brainy Boomers lecture, and this is very important here. On the left, you'll see an MRI template, and this is a cross-section of the brain. The A1 and the A2 point to the primary and secondary auditory cortex. I want you to focus on those. Now we look at the middle and the right brain. On each of these, you will see some purple and blue shading. Those show the BRAC, audit, excuse me, the BRAC staging of, of cognitive impairment. It's basically using a PET marker to sh show tau accumulation. And tau accumulation means basically that the, the cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's is progressing in these areas. And each one of these brains, the middle and the right, show two separate individuals. On that middle brain, we have four different test results. Gap detection, HINT, which is the hearing and noise test, the triple digit, which we just talked about, which are digits in noise, and the SSW. The SSW, again, is a measure of dichotic processing, sound coming to both ears at the same time. You don't need to know anything about those numbers. All you need to know is that, that these numbers are pretty normal. I mean, 20% errors, 5.7 milliseconds for gap detection. You're probably like, I don't know what that means. But that means that this person was doing somewhat normal, maybe a little abnormal. However, if we look to the right, that right brain, we see more color. We see more areas, specifically in the primary auditory cortex and secondary auditory cortex, that there is more tau accumulation. And we found, just in this comparison of these two subjects, that gap detection, auditory temporal processing, hint, speech and noise, also triple digit speech and noise, and SSW, dichotic processing, that these scores were much worse. Okay. How about with amyloid? We know that MCI and Alzheimer's, everybody talks about tau and amyloid. This is a more recent analysis that was done with our work with Pedro Rosaneto. And I, I, I have to admit, this is, this is fascinating. And this is something that uh, maybe I'm just, I, I love being a researcher here, but these, these pictures give us hope that we can use central auditory tests to better understand the brain. And what I really want you to focus on is that there are a couple different things going on. First is that these highlighted regions show a relationship of amyloid plaques with central auditory test performance, meaning that we see more amyloid in these areas when people do more poorly on central auditory tests. But that middle row, that middle row shows a cross section, kind of a, a, a profile view of the brain. And this, this area, this precuneous area, seems to be an area that the amyloid plaques and the central auditory test converge. The precuneus is not the central or the auditory cortex like I just showed you in the slide before, but this is, a, is an area of the brain that is used for sensory integration, visual, auditory, it even has some language integration areas. And it just makes sense that this area would highlight or would be related with amyloid and with our central auditory test, meaning that this could be the region that we use to focus our work and to see how these central auditory tests are related to the brain. So this is great. Also, just as an aside, um, if anybody, if there is a visual researcher in the audience today, the reason that the occipital lobe or the visual audit, visual areas of the brain, um, that kind of back section of the brain, why those would be lighting up, we do not know. So, you know, just as a, a little <laughs> tidbit, if anybody knows what's going on. Um, so I will take it back. 
benefits of the central auditory processing. Why does this matter? Why should you care? Well, central auditory processing is a common process. It happens every single day, like I said. And again, <laughs> you might have some background noise while you're listening to me right now. It is quick. It is quick compared to traditional cognitive testing. I don't want to say it's faster than the MOCA, but we might be able to get a more accessible or faster measure of cognitive function with the central auditory test. It is also more feasible in those low middle income countries. And if you look at this picture, this very handsome guy with a headset on and, a, and an indicator in his right hand, um, those headphones, you're probably like, wow, they're large. They are very, very big. Well, we work with a company called Criari um, that designs these headphones that can be portable, that can be used in suboptimal listening conditions where there is background noise. So we can actually record these and give these tests and kind of eliminate the background noise in the area so we can get a more accurate measurement. Also, central auditory processing is educationally neutral. There is really no effect of education on these tests. As long as the, the test is given in the native language, there is no real education effect. And again, this has implications for various populations and regions around the world. Okay, future directions. Innovative techniques to assess the central auditory system. We wanna make these tests better. But how do we do that? Well, what if we change the background noise of these stimuli that we're, uh, uh, that we're testing? Think to yourself, what is the most detrimental noise in the background when you're trying to understand a conversation at a restaurant or a bar? Well, it's not usually the air conditioner. It's not usually that steady state noise that's going on in the background, but it is more about other people talking, using that, using what's called informational masking, because there's information in it, is probably going to be the best way that we can assess the central auditory system. Mathematical techniques, using innovative techniques like machine learning and different statistical measures might give us better assessments of not only just the central auditory system but incorporating things like age peripheral hearing and even medications that the subject or uh, patient might be on advanced imaging techniques we talked about using fmri and maybe other advanced mri techniques and virtual reality this is an interesting aspect to central auditory function because Every test that we do is done in a lab. It's done with one modality at a time. It's not conducted in the real world. So virtual reality might be able to get us there in a virtual environment, but what if there was a way to capture this information in real time, in the real world? What if there were other metrics that we could capture in real time that we could use to better understand the brain? And with that, I will give it to my colleague, Rachel. Thank you, Chris, for that, for setting up the stage. So imagine a device that you wear that's not intrusive, that's capable of measuring your speech, capturing your breathing, your heartbeats, whether or not you're coughing, clicking your teeth, even blinking your eyes. And I'm not ta talking about any crazy device. I'm talking about a device that we wear almost every day, a ear an earphone. But this earphone in particular is special. Why? Well, first of all, because it has a microphone inside of the ear and a microphone outside of the ear. So I actually have access to everything going on outside of the ear and everything going on inside of the ear. And I also have a speaker that goes inside of the ear so that I can play back any information that you're missing. How is it possible? How can I use a device like this to capture everything from inside of the ear? Well, using these microphones and blocking the ear canal, we're gonna be able to do that due to an effect called the occlusion effect. So what is the occlusion effect? Right now, if you're not wearing earphones, all the signals that are happening inside of your body that are generated by your body, so like your heartbeats, if you're talking your speech, dissipate because there's nothing that's blocking the ear canal. However, if we put a device inside of your ear, all of these signals get amplified inside of your ear. And this is how I have access to all of these different signals. And being able to access all these different signals all the time, whenever you're wearing the device, 
really opens up the door to health monitoring with hearables. So whether or not, whether it's hearing or vocal health or your emotional health or your physical health, today I'm gonna to try to convince you that we can use these devices to measure your health. So let's start with your hearing and vocal. So first of all, like I said, we use an in-ear microphone speech. Chris was very good at talking about all the difficulties with speaking in noise and how noise can affect our um, how we speak and how we hear each other. Well, in very noisy situations, we want to block our ear canals from the noise because we don't want to lose our hearing. But this is difficult because we also lose all of the communication that we might be able to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to be able to do both. We're going to protect you for your, from all of the background noise, but we're also going to use your speech to have a quality, high quality conversation with someone else. So bear with me here. This is some graphs, but I'm going to walk you through it. So what you see here on the X axis, so the axis that's going uh, from left to right, you see frequencies. So that means whether it's low or whether really high that's what frequency is and here I have intensity so whether it's soft or whether it's really loud and what we see from the different microphones is a reference microphone a microphone that's placed in front of the mouth is able to capture all of the frequencies of a speech signal however a microphone that's placed inside of the ear it amplifies the low frequencies so it's kind of like this, but we lose all of the high frequencies well, we want to be able to use the in-ear microphones for speech communication because we want to use the fact that we're already blocking your ear canal from all the noise. So we have a signal that has a higher quality and less noise disturbance in it. But we can't send you a signal that sounds like this, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't really, it's not very intelligible. So Move what we're going to do- to the dark blue background. Oh, I want to, uh, sorry, I want to let you hear the difference between all these different signals. So this is a, a signal that's captured from in front of the mouth. Move the sheet to the dark blue background. Oop, uh, sorry, I messed it up. <laughs> so here we go. Move the sheet to the dark blue background. This is a signal that's captured from in front of the mouth. This is what we're usually used to. And then you're going to hear a signal that's captured from inside of the ear. Here. Move the sheet to the dark blue background. So you see already that all of these low frequencies are amplified. So there's a lot of boominess, we say. And I don't really hear like the S's and the F's and all of the high frequencies so well. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this signal that is really, really noisy and we're going to make it sound like a signal that we can use to communicate properly. So let's say you did not have an in-ear microphone and you were in a noisy situation. This is what your speech is going to sound like. Do any of you understand what this signal is? Uh, if you do, you have super <laughs> good hearing and we should talk after the presentation. But if you don't, that's normal because actually there is way too much noise for you to be able to capture the information that you need. So now we're just going to take the in-ear microphone signal without doing anything to it. And you're going to see already just by using an in-ear microphone, I have access to a speech signal that that's, um, has a higher quality than the signal that you just heard. So already we see that the noise is really reduced and maybe you can start to hear some of the words that are being said. So now we're going to use the algorithms that we've developed to clean the signal and make it sound like a signal that's captured from in front of the mouth. The lazy prowlay and the cool grass. So this is by cleaning the signal. It still sounds a little bit boomy. And now we're going to make it sound like a signal captured in front of the mouth. The lazy prowlay and the cool grass. So we went from a signal that we couldn't really understand to a signal that we could actually understand. And the idea here is that we don't only want to protect your hearing, but we're also going to protect your vocal health. Because if you don't hear and you're in a noisy environment, you're going to start raising your vocal effort and we're going to not be able to talk to each other and we're going to feel the strain of the vocal effort. So this is how hearables can be used for hearing and vocal. And now, which I think is what probably interests you more, we're going to look at the emotional part of things. So as Chris talked about, we know that's quite difficult when we're in a noisy situation to understand speech. 
So let's say I can tell whether or not you're stressed, but how am I going to tell whether or not you're stressed? I'm going to look at some of your physiological signals, but I'm going to capture them from inside of the ear. So from inside of the ear, I can actually capture heartbeats. So what you see here, this is the ECG in red. So this is a typical probe to, to, um, to capture heartbeats. But what you see in black, which looks like noise, is actually not noise. This is a heartbeat signal. And if we look at the spectrogram, so if we take the signal that's in time and we see what it looks like in the frequency domain, so I see where all of the energy is, we can see actually the heartbeats at the bottom. So every time you see this dark spot at the bottom, that's a heartbeat. And what you see here, the, the red, and you have yellow here, this red is actually your breathing. And not only can I tell if you're breathing, I can tell whether or not you're inhaling and whether or not you're exhaling just from inside of your ear. So we use some uh, crazy signal processing techniques to be able to capture these signals from inside of the ear. And what we want to do with this, a little bit like Chris alluded to, we want to use machine learning techniques to tell, are you stressed or are you not stressed? So let's look at what we have so far. So here we put a participant in a condition where they were not being stressed, they were just listening. And we're gonna look at all of the signals that we can capture from inside of the ear. So what you'll have here is uh, uh, the respiration. So we extracted the respiration from the heartbeats. Here you'll have the heart rate. Here it's the ECG. So it's our, our uh, ground truth. This is what we look at to make sure that things are actually going well with our in-ear signal. And what you'll see here is a very important feature. This is called heart rate variability. This is what we will use to tell whether or not you're stressed. So when you're not stressed, what you're going to see is that this moves, it's high and it moves a little bit more. However, when we go into the stress condition, we're going to see that our heart rate variability will be lower and it'll be more steady. So let's look. So you can see that there's a really good uh, correlation between the respiration as well as the heart rate. This is what we want to see. And we see that our heart rate variability, it's increasing. So that means that our, 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 the, in between the beats, we're not consistent. We have different times between the beats. And this is normal when our heart rate is, is not being affected. So in a study, in, in a situation where we are not doing anything different, this is what we should see. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put the participant in stress. And when I say we're going to put them in stress, that is we made them do math. So we made them do math and that stressed them out. And what we're going to see actually is now the heart rate is going to go up, but also this feature here is going to go down. And what you hear actually, we also put a noise to make them even more stressed because we know that noise causes stress. So we stressed them out with, with a stressful signal. And we also had them do math. And what we'll see here is that the heart rate variability is decreasing. And that's because our heart rate is very elevated. So there's actually, we don't really have a lot of room to, to change how our heart is beating because it's already pretty elevated. So using, using, using this, we are able to tell whether or not you're stressed. Right now, you might be wondering, how does this relate to MCI? How does this relate to Alzheimer's? Bear with me, I'm getting there. So let's look at our physical health and how we can look at the physical health with an in-ear device. So just like we can capture a heartbeat signal from inside of the ear, we can capture various nonverbal signals as well. So whether or not you're clicking your teeth, you're clicking your tongue, you're blinking, you're swallowing, you're clearing your throat, you're grinding your teeth, all of these are signals that we can capture from inside of the ear. And what's great is these signals look very different than each other. Some of them look like impulses like ha that happen right away. And some of them have harmonics, for example, like coughing. So they repeat over time, they're voiced. And we're gonna use the fact that these signals are different to train a machine learning algorithm to be able to classify what is the signal that we're hearing. There's nothing better than a demo to show you what we mean. So this is a, a student of mine who has graduated, but what you'll see is he's gonna be uh, clicking his teeth or swallowing and you're gonna see the computer is gonna be able to classify what is happening. 
And what's really cool about this is at some point he's he swall like he's talking, so he swallows his saliva and he didn't mean to, but we'll see on the screen that the computer was able to detect that actually this is what he's doing. So first we're gonna listen to everything that's going on outside of the ear. And what you'll see is some of these signals, we can't even hear them outside of the ear. But then when we listen to it from inside of the ear, this is where we'll be able to really hear them well. So here I am wearing the device, which is connected to the R platform. And here it's classifying in real time uh, what the microphone hears. So here I'm talking and it's classifying his voice. If I click my teeth, who's classifying as uh, clicking of the teeth, clicking of the tongue, same thing. Uh, it can also classify coughing. <coughs> uh, and uh, blinking of the eyes forcefully. And closing of your eyes too. Uh, you can also classify saliva noise uh, from inside the mouth. And uh, that's it. I'm wearing the device which is connected to the R platform. So you'll be able to hear the clicks of the teeth right now that you were not be, uh, able to hear them in the outer ear microphone. I click my teeth. And I'll give you the pleasure of listening to what saliva noise sounds like from inside of the ear. So what you hear, this squeaking sound is actually someone trying to clear the saliva from their noise. So you might be asking, okay, good for you. I mean, why do we even care about this? Well, actually, because just like Chris mentioned, all of these tests that we're doing to try to understand Alzheimer's or MCI are happening in a lab setting. And when we're in a lab setting, we don't necessarily capture all of the information that we want to capture. So what I'm trying to convince you is that with an in-ear device that you wear continuously all the time, whether or not you're working or playing or whatever it is, we have access to all of these signals at the same time. And we have the potential of arriving to early disease detection with these devices because we don't look at one modality at the time, but we look at a bunch of things that are happening at one time. So here are some examples. Let's say I can measure how you're breathing, how you're coughing, I can potentially see whether or not exercise-induced asthma is there because exercise-induced asthma in particular is very difficult to find because it only happens when you're exercising. So people just think they're tired or they're winded, but really there's a wheezing going on that we can detect from inside of the ear and that we'll be able to say, oh, this is not just you being winded, this is potentially asthma. If we look at changes in articulation as well as swallowing and breathing, we can detect something like Parkinson's disease. People who have Parkinson's disease, their symptoms start 10 to 20 years before diagnosis is made. And this is because these symptoms are super subtle. One of the symptoms, for example, is that people who have Alzheimer's disease will take uh, an inspiration, say they will inhale after they swallow and not exhale. I mean, who's gonna be able to tell whether or not you're inhaling after you swallow or not? Even a close person to you or your partner who's lived with you for a long time is not gonna sit there and be like, hey, you took an inhale, you swallowed, right? This is something that a device that's been with you for a long time, that's following you, will be better able to detect these types of anomalies. And if we look at now, not changes in articulation, but changes in in uh, temporal features of speech, so how fast you're talking, as well as swallowing and your eye blinking and your heart rate, we can detect your emotional state. Are you depressed? Are you happy? Are you stressed? What's going on? And then finally, and maybe what's interesting here for all of you is if I not, now I don't look at anything other than what is being said. And I, and I look at your heart rate in various situations, maybe I can detect Alzheimer's disease a little bit. Just like Chris mentioned, when, we're, uh, when we have Alzheimer's disease or when we have MCI, it is stressful for us to be in a situation where we're trying to understand speech and noise. So if I have access to everything going on outside of your ear, and I know that you're in a very noisy environment trying to understand speech, and I recognize that it's more difficult for you than usual. Maybe I can. 
maybe I can detect something like that. And also people who have MCI and Alzheimer's disease will gradually reduce their vocabulary to the point where people do not notice that they're only using the same words all the time. So if you look at the speech context, the semantics, what's being said and used rather than how it's potentially we can detect Alzheimer's disease. Thank you all for listening and uh, we're here for any questions you may have.